Hello, and welcome back to the Future in Review podcast. I'm Barrett Anderson, the COO of Future in Review. For those of you who have never heard of Future in Review before, we run the annual FIRE conference, which The Economist has called the best technology conference in the world. The other arm of our business, Strategic News Service, provides the most accurate source of predictive information to its subscribers about the future of technology and the global economy. And I'm here today with Mark Anderson, our CEO, and the CEO of and chair of Future and Review, who is going to be interviewing me this week. We're f- turning the tables for <laughs> for, a, for a time um, about my latest report in the Strategic News Service Global Report, which was all about Elon and his interstellar empire building. Yes. So, Mark, over to you. Okay, Barrett. Um, now, I think we, we should disclose a couple of things here before we get going. Um, Elon is uh, and has been a longtime acquaintance and friend of mine. And uh, he has been to our fire conference, I think, five times. I'm not quite sure how many. He sold his original Teslas at and drove them as test drives at fire, which a lot of people remember. Um, so we have kind of a history with Elon. Um, maybe that'll help us in understanding who he is today. So um, the first question for you is, there's an awful lot of heat and not maybe as much light with regard to Twitter and his somewhat involuntary purchase of Twitter, now called X. Um, is that picture of him inaccurate in some way, or is it warp? the public view of who he is in your mind? Uh, well, it's hard to say when, when it's hard, it's hard to answer that question because that there's so many different perspectives on Elon in general and how he's running Twitter. Um, I think one of the things that I tend to do when I'm trying to find out more information about someone is to read through accounts from people who are close to them and read through their own accounts, um, read the pros and the cons. And I think one thing we know for sure about Elon that's been true for a long time is that he's a really tough boss, right? So he comes in and he knows exactly what he wants. He does not settle for anything less than that. He does not settle for inordinate, you know, inordinate, inordinate? Am I saying that correctly? (laughs) Insubordinates. Uh, And so, so I think that's true. And that when he came into Twitter, that was a really rough cultural fit for Twitter. He also it was a mismatch. It was a mismatch. And right. it, and Twitter at the time was in fact I would say bloated from like from by all accounts it was extremely bureaucratic, hard to get things done as a company. So those, you know, that was not a surprise. I do think that you know, when you think about who Elon Musk is as a person, that's someone he he has always been. Mm-hmm. What a lot of criticism circles around these days is more of his, uh, he, I would say he, he kind of got like a little bit frustrated, right? Mm-hmm. He became very frustrated with what he perceives as wokeism and progressive yep. commentators and progressive values. And that has come through i think he he can be pretty like knee jerk about how he can put like how he composes himself and what he says online he can he's you know he's had a lot of pretty negative comments that he's made about people that are not necessarily what the public would hope from a you know someone who is running a a company of that level I i would say he's not diplomatic i don't i would call him childish at times and la- and la- and lacking thought emotional thought that's, but- I think that's harsh but anyway he is a, certainly of a nature where he isn't over concerned about w- uh, what others think of him where we all we all are but he's not i don't think i actually disagree okay so so what i think that what i've seen is you know he came up he started Tesla and SpaceX, which you and I have talked about, and Starlink. He's started all of these like really, really impressive companies that fundamentally reinvented PayPal. industries. PayPal, you know, he, he has a history of disruption. And during that time, he went through this, he became essentially one of the most maligned people on Twitter, right? His companies and his work were extremely 
weaponized in, in information warfare. And this is something that I was studying at the time. I was researching all these other companies and Elon and his companies would always come up. So there was a very coordinated and concerted effort to undermine the reputation of Tesla and of Elon and of SpaceX during that time. It was the most shorted stock in history. Yeah. A long time. Yeah. And so I think the, who we are seeing now online and, and, and the persona that we're seeing now is different than the Elon that, that we saw that fire 10 years ago or 15 years ago because what happens when you're under that much scrutiny often when you're mm -hmm. under that much constant criticism often and you feel like i'm trying to do these amazing things for the world and build these incredible new companies yes. is you feel really frustrated and maligned mm -hmm. and so you know when you're thinking about what happened like that that's what we saw kind of emerging in his public persona he went from just like being heads down being completely focused on just doing the work to getting really frustrated, I think, and to trying to and to taking that frustration out through his Twitter account primarily, which I think he still heads down doing the work, but he's become, I think, I don't know about Trump, but I think Elon would be the first or second most read person on X now. So he yes. he, he spends a lot, I would say, too much time, an awful lot like Trump does. He spends an awful lot of time. I don't know how many times a day he writes a tweet that or whatever they're called now. What are they called now? X, X sweet. Oh, I believe. Oh, all right. Um, it, it, it might, I don't know. I know you and I have different views of this fellow. And I would like to spend a sentence on that. Okay. Um, Elon, in my experience, always, always does what he says. And why? He's doing it wise. It tells you why. That's why. There's no artifice. There's no cuteness about it. He just tells you. And there's, I don't know anybody like that. And so um, I always take him at his word, no matter what he says next. If he says, I'm going to fire half the people, he will. He just tells you, you know, it's not like an expression of an emotion. He just, and in his, when he describes himself, which he has done often, he says, his dream is to be the best engineer alive or in history. Well, I believe that. Mm -hmm. So I see him through that lens. I see him as the best engineer ever. Faced with you know a, a hate wave because he took over Twitter, and or or because he's rich, or because this that and the other thing, and I think he's he's doing what he says, but he's getting an awful lot of guff for it. And of yeah. course, I agree with you, when someone is hated as much as he can be, I'm sure it gets to be frustrating, if not anger making, because my view of what he's doing, and, and I have some insight into this, is that. He was, at least in the beginning, his companies, Tesla and SpaceX and SolarCity, these are companies that are only existing today because he wanted to improve the chances of humanity surviving. That right. was only prime directive. Now, when you go through all that and you get so much crap for it, it's got to be frustrating. Definitely. Yeah. And I don't think you and I disagree about that. I, I just think that, you know, we think about, you feel like your opinion is that he is only an engineer. And my opinion is that he's an amazing engineer whose frustration and ego is getting in his way a little bit. So those are, I don't think those are, those are two mutually exclusive things necessarily. Okay. Some people would say he deserves to have a big ego because he's achieved more than anybody in history. But um, I think you're right. He does. And so the, but like, I think what we want, what you and I want to talk about today beyond his ego is more about so there's all this focus on Twitter, right? But Twitter is really kind of like this thing that he that he bought, and he I think he has big ambitions for Twitter still. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it's really only like a teeny tiny part of Mixed dot com. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, like so. So I think you know the, what I what I've written about and what I think is more interesting is okay. So what, while everyone's distracted by all of this hand waving and like you know showmanship going on over at X. Mm -hmm. what's what's going on with the bigger picture because right. that you know to the engineer perspective especially right. that's what's really happening right it, and he has said that x he didn't want to do the deal he didn't he wanted to get out of it he tried to get out of it really hard didn't get out of it was forced to buy it but now that he's got it he says he wants it to be the everything app and i think he's looking at china i think he's mm -hmm. looking at alibaba or one of those yeah. And, you know, it's a pay system. He's already done PayPal. It's a, you know, communications. Well, he's already got that. You can see, like, he could 
bring that into X, maybe as the Chinese copied our stuff and put it all into one company. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a mirror of that process back. I think that's what's happening there. So, but yeah, I think your your view is fascinating from a different perspective. You are a misinformation, a global misinformation expert. And I know you were looking, as you mentioned a minute ago, at the pylon against him. What, what do you know about the details of that? Who was it? Do you know who it was? How many bots were involved or how long? Or what was the point? Well, so I was only doing this work for about six months. So, and it was in, a, I think it was around 2018, maybe. Um, <laughs> that's when I started noticing it. Um, and pretty consistently throughout that time period, there were a very, very large number of bots that were attacking Tesla, piling on to negative comments about Tesla, you know, amplifying negative things about Elon and Tesla and SpaceX, but primarily Tesla and Elon. And so I think that was a deliberate effort. I don't know who, by whom or by what, but we do know that there were a lot of, you know, fake accounts that were doing that. And I think that's partially why he got so interested in Tesla, I mean, I'm sorry, in, in, in Twitter when he was acquiring it, of trying to get them to be public about the numbers, right? Because he was experiencing that himself. Yeah. Um, and he was very, tried to kind of like invalidate the deal because when it came out, like what their actual numbers were and how many accounts were bots. There are a lot of bots in there. A lot of bots. So, yeah. um, but but if we if we kind of like take a look at the bigger picture, what I think is really interesting about Elon and about the companies that he's building is actually the fact that the, he's essentially creating an ecosystem of data sensors, right? So SpaceX is a space sensor, <laughs> you know, space transport, but also space sensor, Starlink, space sensor and Earth sensor. You can see an entire range of satellite images all over the planet, um, Tesla, I don't know. Do you know, is he imaging? I've heard that before, but I'm not sure that his satellites can image. Do you know? I am not sure, but I... I haven't heard it. I've only heard it from people who are scared of him. I do know that... Uh, I would have to double check. Could do it. I do know that, like, for example, um, Starlink, the Starlink network, right, is providing data from all over the world. T uh, Tesla's, communication. Yeah. yeah, communication. Tesla's are providing imagery from all over the world, right? Absolutely. Uh, X is providing sen text sentiment <laughs> from all over the world and, and, you know, language processing and news for sentiment, you know. So it's yeah. kind of, if you look at all of those together, it's a pretty interesting, and Elon himself has tweeted about this. It's like, Combined with all of these things, was his tweet, I probably have the most data access of anyone in the world. Maybe. I think um, of a certain type, he has more. Mm -hmm. you know, the car thing, he's got much more. Um, when you look at what happens with big tech in general, they all kind of morph into the same. It's like the new industrial state. You know, I mean, they, they all kind of morph into the same exact Alibaba model where, I mean, look at Facebook, right? I mean... It just it just ends up having what do you want movies what you want YouTube you want to have threads you know you want to have you know Instagram you want what do you want what do you want what do you, you know it'll be paying things and be VR be Meta and so they're all trying to just be everything one stop shop never leave the store but it feels like to me and you know you, LinkedIn is going that direction too even though it's started out as a job posting but that's so, the opposite of what he's doing that's what makes it interesting well get ready he'll turn Twitter into the everything XCOM. Okay, but you're focusing on Twitter, and I'm saying what I'm trying to say. Big picture is that he is putting very physical I know. data sensors all over the planet. I know um, um, that's true. I, I'm trying to compare what he's doing in his way, mm -hmm. which you're which you're right is much grander and larger than what Zuckerberg is trying to do in his way, or what the Chinese are trying to do in their way. When you talk about the the bots, um, even though we don't know probably where they came from. We know this morning, I think it was, that Facebook announced ripping out almost 5,000 bots and accounts from China over the last couple, three years. And that was the first time they, I think that was the first time they'd made that announcement. And they, you went back like four or five years, they've been watching this stuff and ripping it out. Um, and I know pretty clearly that China is trying to block Elon's satellite program right now. Right. 
And I think they perceive him as a human being, actually, as a greater threat probably than the U.S. Navy. You know, I mean, he is a threat to them because he does so well in rocket launching and in the satellites. He's a threat to everyone because he does so well. well he's that's, a threat to China. That, that's the bigger, I mean, but yeah, but he's also, you know, he's putting, he's providing internet strategically in Ukraine and then turning it off in some areas and not in others. And so, so he is essentially because he's providing all this connectivity and he has all this data access, it's become a much bigger kind of picture move mm -hmm. uh, in a way that like having everyone's iPhone does not. Right, right. I, all I would say, since you brought it up, in the Ukraine situation, I don't know how this works, but I know what he was saying, which is, I want to support defense, not offense. Now, I don't know how that works in a war, but that's what he was claiming. Right. And so, um, in general, I don't see him misusing his power in a way that I would call it misusing. It is certainly disappointed the Ukrainians that he was doing that. But um, in general, I don't see him trying to take sides on things. I mean, people say he is, but I don't think he is. Well, so, if he's if he's choosing the the space in U that was formerly Ukraine and identifying that as Russian territory and turning off the internet because of that, that that would be taking sides. Yeah, if that's true. That's what happened. Um, I'll believe you, but. I, th I think there's another way to see all this, that's all. I don't think he's trying to help Russia. I just think that it's like his free speech stance, which everybody attacks. He claims it's extreme free speech or some, you know, category like that. Um, so therefore, Trump can come back onto Twitter. That's a really big mistake. Or, you know, all kinds of bad things show up on Twitter under the name of free speech. And they do. They do. It's mm -hmm. So... I don't think he wants that to happen, but I think that it maybe maybe in this sense I would agree with you that he's childlike, that he has a childlike belief in ultimate extreme free speech, and then bad things happen. How did that happen? You know, kind of didn't really mean that, but that's the price. Yeah. So uh, he may he may be I don't want to say naive, but you, I think you put it right. He may have an engineer's view of free speech. Right. It may not be all encompassing of. Nazis and other bad people who want to use his platform for evil things. Yeah. 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 I, I do think there is, a, there is a view of him, even including the Ukraine story, where you see him trying to do something which has principle in it, but it may not be working or it may not be what you would have done or anyone would have done. Right, so, and that's that. To be honest, that's his. That is his prerogative. He's built an incredible suite of companies that have global impact, right. and you know, allow things to happen that would never have been able to happen before. And you know, when you become that kind of person, you yeah. take on a new kind of responsibility, and you naturally will bear the slings and arrows of humanity. Right, like that's yeah, unfortunate, but true. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he likes any part of that. Yeah. You know, I mean, Twitter is just the most obvious example. I don't, I don't think that was really in his mind. It's like, make a phone call. Okay. All right. Get a TV show. Okay. Got that. You know, help Africa. Okay. We're going to do that. But I don't think he likes the moderation part or the being the judge of things or any of that. I don't think he likes it. And he, I don't think he feels qualified for it either. Yeah. Well, so um, do you think with all this conversation we're having about him, do people have a whole vision of him or do you think they have a partial vision of him? I think they pretty much only see him. Well, I don't know. I, the, people is a broad perspective, but I would say the general public opinion of him focuses way too much on Twitter and, um, you know, not enough on kind of like the, what he's actually building with mm -hmm. the combination of Sp SpaceX, Tesla, you know, the power, home power, power wall, yeah. The saddle, you know, Starlink, the potential for Starlink, you know, how many sta Starlink satellites is, would it take to service every mobile phone on the planet, mo every mobile device on the planet? I'm sure yeah. you know the answer. 3,000 going up. So you I, can just... I, know, I, <laughs> I know someone who knows the answer to that question. Right. Um, and so I think like when I, when I look at, at Elon, I kind of feel like all of the, 
you know, whatever your opinions of his moves on Twitter or his public opinion, you know, the things that he's saying, it's really kind of a distraction. It's like hand waving. While over here, he's actually building this entire network that can power like an incredibly, you know, immense number of industries and new businesses. And, um, and there's no one else that's in any, like, vague amount of striking distance government or company Mm -hmm. uh on earth that can compete with him in those spaces and that's what i think is really interesting and when you look at you know those censored companies that i mentioned before if you think about tesla starlink uh as as kind of like censored devices you and then you start to look at the other things that he's doing he's got Neuralink, right well okay that would allow you to analyze all of that data using just your brain but you're going to need some kind of an additional AI capability to do that. I think OpenAI was originally intended to be that play. And then, oh, that didn't work out very well. Turns out, <laughs> turns, it turns out not, not the best place for that. So now he's just launched this in July, this mm-hmm. new company, XAI. And, and I think what we're going to see in the next couple of years is him building out the AI and the Neuralink to be some kind of interface for either personally or big picture for those other plays. You might be, but I think I'm glad you brought that up. Open AI. Um, here's something that we almost maybe have never, not never, but almost never hear about him. It, it, often from people who don't like him, but the most heroic thing I think he did so far, and these in, in a way, these are all heroic. You want to go to Mars and say the, make a multiplanetary species from the asteroid. No, great. That's heroic. But um, when he left open, he brought Sam Altman in. He hired him. And when he saw what Sam was headed toward, he quit. Mm-hmm. He walked away. Yeah. He put a lot of money into that thing. And it was supposed to be a not-for-profit, Sam. And so, you know, that was pretty cool. I mean, now we are all talking. We published a thing about the cost of GPT in today's GR, the report. Um, it's pretty high. Um, it's going to kill a lot of people. It's going to do a lot of bad things, Sam. So he walked out on that. And instead, he's created this thing. That, now, since I'm running Pattern Computer, I think we're seven years ahead of him. We've actually got products. He doesn't. But I'm, I appreciate the fact that he named it Explainable AI, because that's what the, the antidote is for Sam now. Mm-hmm. And, um, it, you know, he will have a product someday. And it'll probably be what he's saying, because he usually does what he says. So if he's saying, we're going to try to discover new things in the real world, you know, in nature, well, we're doing a pattern, it works. So if he hits it hard on explainability, he'll do it too. And I think he's, that's exactly what he'd like to do. And so we could try to make up stuff like mind control, but I don't think so. No, no, it's not mind control. Yeah. You're not under- I don't think you're understanding what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm not, saying, I'm not yeah. saying mind control. I'm saying... My mind as as interface, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, how do you parse through billions and billions of points points of data? Yeah, his vision for Neuralink, as I understand it, came long before the break with Sam Altman. Yeah, and the idea was, you know, if you if you're going to be increasing human intelligence, at some point, computers will will exceed our abilities. And how could you bring that back to a human being? Mm-hmm. And that's, you need an interface. Right. Like yeah. yeah. So I'm not buying the whole, you know, it's for people in wheelchairs bit. That's just, it's like saying censorship is to save the children. I think it's for people who want to access the giant database. Yeah, I <laughs> who, want, who want to be able to use the AI to access all the patterns found in Tesla, SpaceX, Starlink yeah. data. Oh, that's possible. So anyway, you know, in all of this, I guess, I hope we've done a little bit of helping here for others. There are a lot of dimensions to this guy. And um, um, there are a lot of ways to describe his his behavior as well as the outcomes of his work, which can be, let's say, controversial. But um, I sometimes pick, imagine if instead of him, it was Howard Hughes, which was happened once, you know. Or imagine it was someone really evil. You know, it, it's Putin instead. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that'd be bad. So in comparison to the possibilities of people with that much money and that much 
global power in the empire, call it, I, I am amazed by how neutral he is. Yeah. He I really seems task oriented. You know, I was I was emailing with Gary Marcus after I put out this report and he said something to me that I think captures at least my opinion of it very accurately. And he said he said, I applaud his ambition mm -hmm. and I wish he could listen a little bit more to the people around him. <laughs> Hear that, Ela? <laughs> yeah, good point. I and like, I, and I feel like that's a really, that's actually a pretty well captured, uh, you know, synthesis yeah. of like, can he build it? Check. Yeah. Can he do things that are pretty much impossible? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Does he listen very well? I don't know. No. Not, not according to accounts. For, you know, I think, and that's a, a thing that happens in general when you become very wealthy and you run a lot of companies you can tend to develop this kind of echo chamber around you within companies, right? Because people I would just- Again, differently. You're right, Spirit, you're right. But in his case, imagine that you had just done five companies from PayPal, there was one before that, I mean, zip quick. All these companies, they all succeeded, every one of them. Mm -hmm. They get bigger and bigger and better and better and bigger and bigger, and here's the empire. Now, th that didn't happen from ego. That happened because he was right so often. We actually went into this in a fire interview with him one time, but he is extraordinarily, he has amazing memory and he's extraordinarily intelligent. So it makes a great, great engineer. And at some point at the, in SpaceX, probably where you're fired off your 50th rocket and you're putting Boeing out of business and NASA is your best friend and you're controlling, you have more launches than anybody in the world is, by a factor of a hundred or something. At some point you're going to say to yourself, you know, he probably listens to five people inside SpaceX, but not the world at large. Because you know what? You know, he, he didn't need to to build SpaceX. He didn't need to, do, to build Tesla. He needed to find five brilliant engineers like him and then work like hell. And, and then it worked. So it may not be that he's totally tuned into listening to others the way you and I might be, because we perhaps need it more. <laughs> we not need it very much and therefore doesn't use it. Yeah. Utilitarian. Yeah, that's 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 one way of putting it. I, I, I would <laughs> I no. would argue that when you have that much, you know, global power and influence, it's important to listen to others outside of your inner circle of five. He may not agree with that. I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I think we might be monkey wrenches in his mind. Like you're a good mm -hmm. one or a bad one. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we covered it. Do you yep. think so? All right. Maybe he'll think so too. We should, we'll send it to him at the end. Right. All that. right. Well, well, thank you for, thank you everyone out there, podcast listeners and viewers for joining us for this conversation. Um, this gives you a little bit of a sense of what our uh, family dinner table conversations were like when I was growing up. A lot of, a lot of uh, learning and listening and talking and some disagreeing, but also fun. generally speaking, fun. <laughs> Thank you, Barrett. Yeah. See you all soon. Come to fire. Come.